Good morning. A warm welcome to all of you who are worshiping together in the Spirit of Hope United Church Sanctuary in Edmonton, and to those of you who are here virtually through the live online broadcast. For those here in person, please stay for a time of visiting and refreshments after church. You are welcome whether this is your first time here or you have come before. We welcome each other and share fully in the life of the church, regardless of age, <clears throat> ethnicity, gender identity, ability, sexual orientation, or economic circumstances. You are welcome as you are for who you are, equally loved and valued by God. <clears throat> My name is Karen Astrope, and I'm a member of the MNP committee here at this church. Let us now acknowledge the land. We acknowledge that the land on which Spirit of Hope United Church sits was covered by Treaty 6 when it was signed in the 1870s, decades before this area was given the name Alberta. The territories of Treaty 6 are traditional meeting grounds, gathering places, and travel routes of many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. Today, we are grateful and honored to gather on Treaty 6 land. Those of you gathering in other places, please be mindful and grateful for the history and legacy of the first peoples to know the land where you are. So this is just announcement time. Um, you all have access to the Spark and you can check on all the activities that are happening here. And now if anyone else has any announcements they want to bring forward, this is the time to do that. Uh, we postponed uh, the youth gym night last Friday to this Friday. So uh, usually it's the first Friday of the month. If you have a, a teen or you know somebody who'd like to come, we just have open gym night on Friday night. First Friday of every month, but this month it's the second Friday. And uh, always looking for more supervisors. So if you are interested in supervising a gym night with a helper, um, just get in touch with me. Thanks. Not used to all the silence at that part of the service. Uh, <laughs> there are lots of things going on in the life and work of the church that help us to connect and learn together. Uh, as we gather in worship this morning, let's uh, take a moment to greet those near you, uh, welcome each other to church, and uh, we'll light our candle and remind us that we are all in each other's company and in the company of uh, God and, and all that is uh, around us today. So let's greet each other in the life and work of Good morning, Tim. How are you?
All right. So, uh, lots of things that we can talk about in church today. Uh, some of it is, uh, is about where we can go and how we can get from one place to another. Um, you know, it's not always easy to figure out where we're going. And, uh, Math. Math. That's nice. there we go. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are some, some of us who, who are, are always unable to see literally with our eyes. Uh, some people are born without uh, being able to see very well, and, and some people's lives lead to the point where they don't see uh, after having been able to see. Uh, but I think all of us, uh, even those of us who are, are blessed with the ability to be able to see uh, reasonably well, uh, we, we know what it's like when it's too dark to make out where we're going. And uh, it can be a little bit scary. Uh, I had a friend uh, one time, uh, we were driving down a country road, and, uh, and he just kind of turned to me and he said, you want to see something really scary? And he just turned the lights off on the car. <laughs> and it, there was no moon out that night, and it was completely dark. And of course, I start to panic, and my friend waits for me to panic just enough so that he enjoyed me being panicky and turned on the lights. And uh, it's, it's not fun to have no idea what's right in front of you. Uh, it can be a little bit scary when you don't have anything to guide your way, not even a, a railing. And I know there's a candle nearby, <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure where it is. So I know there's something that could be dangerous to me or to other people close by, and I can't quite Oh, I could go the other way, and, and then I might bump into, I, I might bump into the organ, I might play some music. Um, one of the really cool stories in the Bible comes right at the very beginning of the Bible, and it says that one of the first things that God ever thought about was making it so we could find our way in the dark. And, God, and the story goes that God did that by creating light. I, thought, I didn't think I was this close. <laughs> Ooh, well done. <laughs> and it's not that, that darkness went away. It's that light and darkness got to be together. Because if all we have is light, it's just as bad as all we, ha all we have is dark. But when you have light and dark together, you can kind of find your way. I love that our Bible starts by saying, let there be a way to find your way. That's just something I thought would be interesting to think about today. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For helping us. For helping us. Find our way. Find our way. Amen.
first reading this morning is Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the earth became chaos and emptiness, and darkness came over the face of the deep. Yet the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Light, be, and light was. God saw that the light was good, and God separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness night. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day. The second reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Immediately, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. May we find some, some insight, some inspiration, some learning, some comfort as we reflect on the words of Scripture today. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas to all of you who follow the Julian calendar. For those of us uh, in the Gregorian tradition, yesterday was January 6th, and therefore was the day of Epiphany. Epiphany always occurs 12 days after Christmas. Traditionally, Epiphany is that day of the church year when we hear the gospel story about foreign visitors bringing gifts of frankincense, myrrh, and gold to Jesus and also how King Herod had a genocidal anger at being tricked by these visitors. And uh, I apologize if you feel that you missed out on that part of the Christmas narratives during the church services this year. Last week, December 31st, felt a little early to start focusing on Epiphany. And besides, I, I felt really kind of drawn to talk about the Simeon story. Uh, which is also part of that Christmas narrative. Now, most years we get 
two Sundays between Christmas and Epiphany. This year, with Christmas being a Monday, we only got one. So that limits the number of Christmas stories we might be able to focus on. But if you do want a Magi-focused Epiphany service, you can check out the video or the sermon notes from January 8th last year, which was an Epiphany-focused service. Uh, I think it's still relevant. I didn't look. The first Sunday after Epiphany, which we are technically at today, always invites us to hear about the start of Jesus' public ministry, beginning with a baptism by John. It's a story that I skipped over last year because I wanted to focus on the Magi. Uh, you know, unless January 6th is a Sunday, most years I have to kind of put the Magi on the service before the 6th, or I'm going to have to choose between the Magi and the baptism on the Sunday after the 6th. I don't think I've ever tried to do both stories together. But I'll never say never. Uh, although the next time that we only get this one Sunday between Christmas and Epiphany is not till 2028. And by the way, the next time we actually get Epiphany on a Sunday is not going to be until 2030. Now, most of us will probably still be around, but probably none of us will remember what I just said, including, <laughs> including myself, I'm pretty sure. If you've been in church on either of the last couple Sundays, you may have noticed that the Christmas season does not include readings from the book of Mark. And that's because Mark shares absolutely no details about the birth of Jesus. Mark has no shepherds, no angels, no manger, no magi, no star, no angry King Herod. None of that is in Mark. The closest that Mark's gospel ever comes to acknowledging that Jesus was born to Mary happens as an adult in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, when after preaching to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, someone actually just downplays any authority Jesus might have by saying, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? That's as close as Mark comes to telling Christmas to us, that Mary was his mother. And not surprisingly, that verse did not result in any memorable Christmas carols or pageants. <laughs> Instead of Christmas, Mark begins with Jesus' baptism. So whatever may have happened earlier, Mark is either uninformed or uninterested. According to the oldest narrative of Jesus' life, Mark is the first biblical gospel to be written down. The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ begins in the wilderness east of Jerusalem about the year 30 and not in a manger in Bethlehem about the year 4 BCE. Because we happen to be in year B of the Revised Common Lectionary, we get to hear about Jesus' baptism from the Gospel of Mark today. In year A, we would hear it from Matthew. In year C, we would hear it from Luke. If I had started that Mark reading today a few verses earlier, we would have heard that John the Baptist had been already active long before Jesus showed up. Many people were coming out to the Jordan River to be baptized by John as, as an act of, of confession, as an act of repentance. And we would have heard that John was a bit eccentric. Uh, he wore a robe made from uh, camel's hair, and he lived and uh, subsisted in the wilderness alone, eating insects and wild honey. We would have heard that John before Jesus came, preached about someone who was greater than he still to come, who would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Mark's version of Jesus' baptism, likely that first one to be written down, uh, 
is still very similar to the other accounts in Matthew and in Luke, who probably had a copy of Mark as their template when they began to write down their Gospels. In fact, Jesus' baptism is almost identical in Luke as it is in Mark. But it's Matthew who makes a, a few interesting edits. You know, what Mark and Luke don't include that Matthew does is Mark is the one where John, when having Jesus come to be baptized, directly says to Jesus that I'm not worthy to baptize you. Uh, other Gospels, like Mark, say that uh, in general, when talking about this one to come, John would say, I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. Uh, but in Matthew, straight to Jesus, I should not be baptizing you. And in Matthew, when the voice from heaven is heard, the whole crowd hears it, and not just Jesus. In Mark and Luke, uh, like we heard this morning, the language is in the second person. The voice is talking to Jesus. You are my beloved. In Matthew, it's in the third person, describing Jesus. This is my beloved. In today's reading from Mark and, and in Luke, Jesus is presented simply as being among the crowd who were being baptized that day. There's no attention given to Jesus beforehand. There's no conversation between John and Jesus that seems to be any different than may have happened with anyone else there. And that voice, like I said, speaks directly to Jesus. You are my beloved. Luke is a little bit ambiguous as to whether when the, whether the crowd could see the Spirit descending or whether the crowd could hear that voice talking to Jesus. But when we hear Mark, it reads like Jesus is the only one who can see and hear. It says, Jesus saw the heavens open and the Spirit come down. And definitely the language is you speaking directly to Jesus. There's no hint in Mark that anyone else could see what Jesus was experiencing. I think it makes a difference if everyone sees the Spirit and hears the voice, or whether it's just Jesus. If everyone hears it, it kind of serves to proclaim it and to miraculously confirm to the crowds that day that Jesus must be this greater one to come that John was talking about. If it's only Jesus who sees and hears it, the crowd doesn't get that insight about Jesus at that point. The story does sound different if that descending of the Spirit and the affirming voice was just a private experience for Jesus alone at that time. It keeps a bit more mystery for a while. It puts the impact of Jesus more on his eventual teachings and healing ministry than a proclamation right at the start. Mark is the oldest version. Now Matthew and maybe Luke chose to make some edits and expand that experience because the readers would know the end story. What follows the baptism, in whatever version we read, is definitely a private experience for Jesus. The last verse that we heard today told us that Jesus followed up the baptism by retreating into the wilderness alone. If we'd have read one more verse, we would have heard that this wilderness time in the wilder in, for Jesus lasted 40 days during which time Jesus was tempted by Satan. And as though they were animals there, Mark tells us that Jesus was looked after by angels. Again, Mark's version of the wilderness part is very brief. Only those two verses, saying that Jesus wrestled with temptations and was not harmed by any wild animals. Matthew and Luke are the versions that add specific details about the temptations. Mark says that the good news starts with baptism. And in fact, all three Gospels use this baptism to send Jesus off in a new direction, not just into the wilderness, but then from the wilderness into a new way of living. The baptism 
initiates new possibilities. Speaking of new directions and possibilities, after church today, I'm going to have to rush off. I, I don't even think I'll be able to sort of hang out at the back door because uh, I have to attend a meeting at another United Church uh, on behalf of the Northern Spirit region. That church's last minister moved to a different church last spring, and so they've been without a regular minister since then. Uh, they've been relying on pulpit supply and eventually a half-time ministry appointment. Uh, while they work on their future plans and what kind of ministry leadership they would need going forward, and I've been with the one working with them as a pastoral relations liaison, guiding them through this community of faith profile and search process. Well, today they are ready to offer the full-time position to their successful applicant. And as a liaison, I have to be there when they make those formal decisions. So have a sip of coffee on me. <laughs> As I said earlier, I, I really love uh, that story of creation. Uh, and I love the fact that in, in year B of the lectionary cycle, that always includes the baptism of Jesus from one of the first three Gospels on this first Sunday after Epiphany. In this year, it gets paired with the poetic language of the first day of creation. I may have mentioned it before that when I was at theological college, I took a, an intensive three-week course uh, as an introduction to biblical Hebrew. Uh, and as a way of learning to read and translate, we spent some time in every class over those three weeks taking turns going around the room reading from the Hebrew version of the Bible. And every day we always started back at Genesis 1, verse 1. So if you got to read a little later in the week, you probably would love to be the first one because we all knew that Genesis 1, verse 1, after a few days, like it was something we'd always known. Uh, to that point, to this day, 37 years later, I still remember that the Hebrew verse that begins our Bible is Bereshit bara et Elohim, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim, the et ha audits. I'm sure my accent is horrible, but I remember the words. And I even remember how to translate it, and I could read it. In fact, I've got it written in Hebrew in my notes. In the beginning created God the heavens and the earth. In spite of what some preachers might tell you, Genesis is not a description of how the earth and the heavens came into existence. The language of Genesis is metaphorical, it's poetic. It describes the world in the end that was known and experienced by the ancient Hebrews. They end with the world they can see and, and experience. And the story tells them that God is the origin of what they know. Now we know that the stars are not dots of light fixed to a physical barrier up in the sky that if we were tall enough or could climb high enough, we could touch but the stars are faraway nuclear furnaces of burning gas. We know that there is actually no ocean above that barrier that occasionally leaks down as rain. We know that there's no vast ocean under all of the land of the earth that we can get access to by digging wells. We know that the moon is not in fact a light created to govern the night, but it only reflects light from the sun, which is still there, but we can't see at night. And we know that to get the world how it looks today, even as it looked to the ancient Israelites, took a lot longer than six days. Now, I never deny the truth of Genesis. I just don't take it literally. It's a proclamation that God created, not how God created. It's in that context that today's reading as a first divine act of creating the world the ancient Hebrews knew, the first thing that I notice is that God doesn't create out of nothing. 
that God already exists with something before this story begins. The primordial raw ingredient of creation is disorder. It's chaos, described by the ancient storyteller who wrote Genesis as an empty and dark ocean. And that could make sense to the ancient Hebrews, because they could imagine nothing more chaotic than being lost at sea on a starless, moonless night with the waves raving them in different directions and having no sense of what direction they were going in or where they were or what might be coming over the bow in the next second. A dark, churning void of an ocean is what predates God's work. I also remembered that the adjective that's used in Hebrew, tohu vavohu, which I also remember to this day from that Hebrew class, uh, which usually gets translated as formless and void. That's the way the King James translated it. I like the fact that, that the words tohu vavohu sound chaotic. It sounds like the words feels chaotic, tohu vavohu. Although it's technically not a form of onomatopoeia, tohu vavohu still sounds like what it's describing, chaos. The only thing that seems to have had any order in this chaos before any creative action happens is the Spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. And the Hebrew language there is literally face instead of surface, poetic. The translation we read today translated that verb of what the Spirit was doing as brooding. Others use hovered or moved over the waters. Uh, all of those are pretty decent translations, I think. But another implication of the root word there, rakpa, is to be relaxed. It's also a word that would be described something that's fluttering or just kind of floating. In that way, that verb is very passive. When we think of brooding or hovering or moving, we think of it being active. But there is an implication in there that the Spirit of God is just relaxingly waiting for something, just kind of fluttering, floating over the waters. The earth was chaos and emptiness, and darkness was over the face of the deep, yet the Spirit of God was calmly waiting over the surface of the waters when God said, let there be light. And then light existed and darkness no longer dominated. And we read that darkness did not vanish, as I was saying earlier. It now shares the earth with light, what we and the ancients called night and day. A few verses later, we could hear that night has some light, even though it's supposed to be the dark time. The night has the moon and the stars. And we all know that even on the brightest light of the day, there are still dark places because the light can't penetrate and go through everything. It creates shadows. So now there's order to this chaos when light and darkness share existence, when shadow and perspective are created. We can see where we're going and how we might get there we're not stumbling in the dark and we're not blinded by the light. And Genesis says, this is good. The metaphoric insight that I, I get from Genesis is that the, com complete, co the completion of uh, complementing of darkness with light allows us to set off in new directions. It gives the, that gift of perspective to set the stage for the rest of creation. We can now see in 3D. Middle-aged Jesus saw something engaging in the river ministry of John, and it changed the direction of Jesus' life. As I said earlier, Mark quotes Jesus' neighbors as saying he's a carpenter by trade. But after being with John and spending 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus does not go back to his carpenter shop full time. His life sets off in a new direction. So here we are on the edge of a new year, on the leading edge of something 
that our calendar says is beginning. And every one of us has experienced new things since last year's new year. For some of us, that new is dramatically different than the way it was. But even for others who, where it might be more similar, it's not the same. Our collective life as a community of faith is not the same as it was last January. How cool is it, though, that that, that yarn art progress flag that went missing more than a year and a half ago just showed up again this week? When it disappeared in June 2022, it had only been outside the church for a few days. I think we had one Sunday that it was there. That summer saw many progressively minded churches victimized and vandalized for their overt inclusion of all sexual orientations and gender identities. On on one hand, having the yarn flag back again is like we've turned the clock back, but it's really a new time. We don't know its story. We don't know this flag story, and, and we may never will. But wouldn't it be cool to here are the adventures of the pride progress flag that it had between June 19th, 2022, when it went missing, and December 29th, 2023, when it came back? Was it in one place that whole time? Was it hidden away or was it on display? Did it change hands? Was it lost and found more than once? What circumstances resulted in its return? We can only guess. I mean, I kind of like to imagine that the yarn flag disappeared in a spontaneous act of exclusion and fear. Someone saw what it represented and said, I don't like that, I'm taking it away. I mean, it's possible someone said, that's beautiful, I would love to have that for myself. But given the context and the time we were in, it kind of said, makes sense to me that someone saw it as some, speak of something they didn't want anyone else to see. If that's the case, I'd like to imagine that it changed and softened some hearts on its journey back. I'd like to imagine that it set someone else off who chose a new direction. We don't know how long we'll have it. And maybe it's doing better work when it's not on our our railing. This coming Wednesday, the church's leadership team is going to have its first meeting of the new year. Um, I imagine we'll have conversations that will include what new or renewed directions the congregation might be considering over the coming year. Very similar in some ways to what that congregation I'll be meeting with a little later this afternoon is talking about their new possibilities, how we might help move those goals along. You know, being a healthy church means to enthusiastically set out in new directions and not focus only on maintaining what we have now. And that same is true for each of us, not only as a church, but on an individual level. We are created to seek out new generations. We are created in a world that gives us that ability to imagine where we might go next, to be curious about the new paths that are lit before us, to go into the unknown wilderness. You know, in faith, we can believe that we're not alone, that we are beloved creatures of God, that the Spirit of God hovers patiently near us, ready to guide, ready to inspire, ready to support. I mean, the Genesis storyteller reminds us that new things begin with the gift of a a greater perspective. John the Baptist reminds us that we can change direction and discover pleasing belovedness on the other side of the river. Like the renewed life that that flag outside our church expresses, each of us are new creations each day. May that knowledge and faith hover deep within us, ready to shine. This is good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let's join our, our hearts in prayer. Holy Spirit, hover close to us in this time. Be our guide through times of new creation, through new opportunities and possibilities. Be with us as we move through change, which is not always easy. We pray, God, for all who are living with uncomfortable change, whether it's change in health, being affected by the change in weather, the uncertainty of where one might sleep or eat next. We pray, God, for those who are worried, feeling uncertain, feeling alone. Remind everyone, God, that they have this guiding and protecting spirit. We pray, God, that we might be the manifestation of that company for others, that through our openness, our willingness to accept our call to be something more than we are today will bring goodness into people's lives so that they can stand at the end of each day and say, this is good. We pray, God, for the courage to move through difficult times. We pray, God, for the wonder to discover things we did not expect to incorporate them into our plans moving forward. We pray this, God, in Jesus' name, who faced uncertainty and major changes and still was able to find your spirit active in this world. We pray Jesus' family prayer in, in a style passed on to us in the book of Luke. Creator, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. Amen. There are many ways that uh, people support each other and the life of the church that we share. Uh, as we take time to share some of the offering uh, uh, provided today, uh, let's hear a story of the impact of our giving together. So for the month of January, the MS um, asked four staff members to share a story that was meaningful to them and tell us a bit about why. So today's is called Learning the Gospel at Camp. Church camp has been an important part of my faith journey. I attended youth camp as a teen with my girlfriend, who would later become my spouse, counseled for a couple of summers, and our kids started as soon as they could and went for many years. It was as a counselor that I learned many of the important practical skills that impacted my years of congregational ministry. United Church camps are one of the longest lived and most successful training grounds for leaders and for sharing gospel living that the church has. I'm happy to know that mission and service is part of helping them continue. And that's from Dave Jagger, Community of Faith Stewardship Lead. together. Holy, generous God, bless our lives and our giving, the 
time, prayers, and resources that we offer are acts of praise and service. Amen. Amen. Many paths before us. They may be filled with peace or grace or joy, but they are always hovered over by the Spirit of our loving God. Let us go in joy to love and serve this God. Amen. I am the light of the world. 